welcome to the NCTV Media Center production uh, with noted architect Jeff Gold. It's both an honor and a pleasure to be with you, Jeff. Uh, uh, we have a friendship that goes back many years, and it's been wonderful to both be a friend and an admirer of the work that you've completed. The program, the show, will actually illustrate your career uh, over 45 years of uh, design and construction work in our community and elsewhere, <clears throat> and a life that has uh, um, really illustrated your uh, talents and art in the field. So, welcome. And well, thank you, Lou, for this conversation. I've been looking forward to it, and I, you know, I treasure our relationship and, and our work in this community over the last 50 years. Well, let's start uh, because I know that your interests in uh, design and construction began at a very early age, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and uh, and also what supported and encouraged that in you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly what potion my parents used on me, but I was playing blocks at a very early age and just loved the block playing. And uh, I grew up in an Eichler home in Palo Alto, which was a, uh, it, was, it was a modern, simple home that was built um, after World War II. And uh, it had you know, particular attention to the architecture and the sense of connection to the indoor and outdoor. I, I have at a very early age remember designing homes, drawing houses, and um, in, when I was 10, I uh, put up a sign saying, this is the next uh, Edward Durrell Stone in the making on my door in our, in our house. And Edward Durrell Stone was the architect of the Stanford Hospital, a, a building that I had come to know in, in the late 50s, and then did a career report um, in eighth grade saying I wanted to be an architect. And in 10th grade, my favorite class was the drafting, and that was when I actually designed fully my first home. So it, it all seemed to unfold as, as something that I really had a, a, a deep urging to do and, um, and then you know, left home in, in 66 to, to take a course in, um, uh, towards studying architecture and, and the related fields. Um, there's, we could look at a few images that, uh, from those early years. Um, one, actually, that my, my parents left me um, of working on, uh, with blocks when I was uh, three in a preschool that my uh, mother uh, taught. And, um, and then a picture of uh, the Eichler that I grew up in. Um, now the Eichler homes were, are quite outstanding. Now I think they're they're preserved and uh, and valued. Uh, uh, it was a community in the Palo Alto area. Is that where you spent your childhood? Yes, this is uh, a development of 200 homes with a community center and a pool and a park and a preschool and a, and a community hall. And um, everyone shared those common facilities. Uh, there were uh, oftentimes gates between fences, so there was a sense of, of, of neighborliness, and uh, there were community events. The homes were very simple homes with primarily glass, exposed timbers, simple detailing, use of exposed wood, and um, <clears throat> it really spoke to my parents who were interested in architecture, and it, it, it was a lovely home to grow up in, very simple. <clears throat> they were affordable. Um, I, I think that they were fifteen thousand dollars at the time when we we bought our home in Green Meadow, and now it's they're um, they're all over a million dollars. They're they're actually uh, there's tight architectural controls within the community to preserve the the heritage of the, the intentions of the design. So already <clears throat> in the formative years, not only were you surrounded with. <clears throat> structures that were, you know, artistic in design, but a sense of community. Uh, you later went to Berkeley in the 60s, uh, also a sense of community. The one I'm building on is here we are talking in Nevada City, Nevada County, 
and we're both living in the community uh, that we were drawn to for many of the same reasons. So if you could describe your uh, time at Berkeley uh, and then maybe where you left from Berkeley and went on. <clears throat> Well, when I left, left home, I actually started uh, my undergraduate studies at Antioch College in Ohio, and Antioch had a co-op program, and I was really drawn to it with the idea that I would be able to go to college and also go out into the world and, and be an apprentice to study architecture. So that, the draw to Antioch was um, uh, the co-op program for back and forth off campus, off camp, uh, on campus. and. Uh, it had a Quaker background and a sense of cooperativeness, and it was a, a fairly radical program, so you could literally design your own program. So I, that, all that kind of drew me there. I had never been east of Lake Tahoe before I left for college in 66. Having gone to, call, to Antioch for two years, I, I did some apprentice, uh, apprenticeships during the work-study programs in city planning in Boston and uh, then landed in San Francisco and joined a firm as a beginning apprentice in architecture in 68. And that segued to actually transferring for a year of interim study at Berkeley in 68. And in, in those years, Berkeley and the whole Bay Area and many places in the country were, it was, it was there was a real cultural revolution going on and in the design field, the, the UC architecture school was actually called the College of Environmental Design. It wasn't the architecture school. And that was a shift of emphasis that, you know, the, the, the whole environment and the ecology movement was really gaining, gaining, you know, momentum and increasingly architects were being asked to look at larger issues of sustainability and the values of resource use and how buildings are having an effect in the environment and our culture. So, you know, that was the, the climate of Berkeley. It was very exciting. I um, would spend every afternoon in San Francisco working in the Osborne and Stewart Architectural Office and spend evenings at, uh, on campus in the studios. It was a, kind of an around-the-clock living and breathing architecture for me having a small bungalow, living alone for the first time. So that year was really formative for me. And through Osborne and Stewart, I was, had the opportunity to be involved with some very exciting projects with the, the Quaker group at Ben Lohman in Santa Cruz uh, Mountains, their, their retreat center, and then a, an intentional community that was forming in Sonoma County called Monin's Rill, and um, also experimenting with light shows and sensoriums. We put on a show in Grace Cathedral with 2,000 people and had carbon arc projectors to project images of, of nature on mm -hmm. the walls of this cathedral as the music from the church organist and the Steve Miller's Blues Band were, <laughs> were dialoguing with each other from one end of the cathedral to the other. So the, that was the climate and the, the kind of the excitement the other was, was really the coming out party for Gary Snyder mm -hmm. in the uh, Sheridan Palace um, Hotel where there were uh, 500 people gathered and he read his um, Smokey the Bear Sutra for the first time publicly. That's and, my favorite. You know, we, <laughs> as he was reading that, we projected images of nature mm -hmm. on the walls of this uh, beautiful space. So. Yeah. There was this sense of, of a real um, kind of crossroads of, of looking at where we are as a species and how are we handling ourselves in, in the world and how does design and architecture fit into that. So through Osborne and Stewart, I, I, I met Gary Snyder and um, the, the, the year Berkeley transitioned to then having the opportunity to spend a summer in, the, in 1970 helping Gary and Massa build their home in the Sierra foothills on San Juan Ridge, and that was my introduction to Nevada County. So we went up in the winter of 69 to fell the trees. This was going to be a, a very simple farmhouse. So let's take and, a look. Uh, we can take some pictures. This is us going up in the summer of 69, the winter of 69, 
with a two-man saw and a broad axe uh, felling the trees. You're talking about a two-man, hand man, yeah. no power, off the grid, right. uh, everything done by hand saw. Right. Yeah. So this house was based on very traditional Japanese um, style uh, as Gary Amasa had uh, experienced in Japan yeah. and wanted to bring. This is us uh, carrying these these heavy logs by hand through the forest and meadow to the house site. And um, preparing the logs, they were peeled with a draw knife and, and notched at the ends with a, what's called a hand adze to put a bevel on them. And we gathered granite boulders from the Uber River and used those as the bases for the posts to support this post and beam pole framed house. All of this work was done by hand, no power through the construction. And the connection between the poles and the stone were, were set by a hand drill of pounding a three pound jack. It took about three hours to drill one inch into these granite boulders to set the pin that connected the foundation to the posts. All of the notching was done uh, by hand with a broad uh, chisel called a schlick and um, and hand saws and draw knives. And um, this home was, was put together over a summer with 12 of us camping out on site, sharing, cooking, and meals, meditating in the morning. Gary would give lectures about Buddhism and poetry, and then we would work each day. And um, at the end of the month, we would be uh, compensated and in addition to our room and board and our whole learning experience we would each be given a shot of tequila and a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> so that was uh, how we put this house together and I was responsible for directing the work and gathering all the materials. The, the tile roof was one of the the splurges that came from Gladding McBean and um, that was you know, that was a, a very formative experience for me to not only be involved in the design and the drawings for that building at Osborne and Stewart, but then coming up and implementing yeah. that and building that with, in a cooperative manner with a group of, right. of, of like-minded people. And you, you were crew boss. This was still part of your undergraduate work. You had not That's become, right. uh, you hadn't even gotten a degree in college yet, let alone an architectural right. degree. You didn't have a an architectural license, uh, you were in charge of this project, which, how old were you at the time? I was mm -hmm. 20 years old. 20. Quite a project to be in yeah. charge of, a large responsibility, and we all know that Gary Snyder's moving to this area, along with Allen Ginsberg and Jerry Brown and, you know, the whole um, uh, entourage of poets had a major influence, you know, on mm -hmm. all of us, uh, which is one, one of the reasons that I'm here. And the, the back to the land movement, the uh, being tied into watersheds and environments still remains as a major uh, impetus for people's being here and the work that we all do. Yeah, the, so. the, the crew that built this house, um, we actually were so drawn to it that we bought land and set up the first um, cooperative land um, group in on San Juan Ridge and we actually had to change some county ordinances and right. regulations to be able to allow us to share this land and hold it in right. common. And the community of Ananda was established. That's right. A major community which is uh, thriving to this day so uh, which continues to have a, a dialogue mm -hmm. um, with uh, not only this community but you know others in the world. So following this, the building this home, I went back to complete my studies at Antioch and actually um, had received a grant from the Sloan Kettering Foundation to start an environmental design department at Antioch. And I set up the curriculum and taught classes the last two years after building Gary's house. And part of that grant included documenting building Gary and Moss's house and we have an archive of some thousand photographs in black and white of the whole story of that and a video has recently been put together uh, telling that story. Right. So, you know, after completing my studies at, at Antioch, I um, 
wanted to go on to graduate studies and, and um, applied to Yale University because it was a small school and there were some, it was a very attractive uh, program because of the particular architects that were being drawn in from all over the world to teach uh, design studios there. Um, and then began my studies there, but again, th those were interrupted by opportunities that, that came up um, after the first year, a, a family uh, asked me to design and build a home for them on the Malibu coast, and it was an opportunity that it was hard to turn down. So I fashioned an independent um, study course at Yale, um, got the, uh, the, the supervision of one of the architect professors to help me through that process, and designed, got permitted, a home, assembled a construction crew, many of which had built Gary's house with me, and we camped out and built a, built a home in Malibu in the summer of 72. So that was a break in my schooling. I think we have a few photographs of that that we can look at. Um, yeah. So this is, again, as we look, this is the, the This is the design rendering of, yeah. of the Malibu house that sat on a bluff, Nicholas Bluff, um, in Malibu above the Pacific Ocean. Very simple home, 30, 30 feet by 30 feet, I think an overall 1,200 square feet of space. Um, a heavy timber structure. Um, this is laying out the foundation, the beginning of the excavation, the house is burrowed into the, the hillside with deep caissons set into the bedrock. So um, a heavy timber structure of that um, was expressed both on the inside and outside uh, with infill panels of wood and glass. So again, sort of mirroring my upbringing in the Eichler homes, it, it had a very, uh, had a simple, um, quality to it with a sort of an honest expression of the materials and a sense of transparency and connection to the landscape. And a wonderful view <laughs> of the ocean and a great placement right. on the hillside, very much incorporating mm -hmm. the environment. Uh, this, yeah. this home, um, I just revisited that home mm -hmm. after this is now um, a little over 40 years later and there are three homes on either side of it that were taken down to be to be made into the uh, estate for Michael Eisner, but this home was re was saved, and so I wasn't able to actually go inside. But it's still standing as part of a behind a, a high security gate as part of Michael <laughs> Eisner's uh, home. Well, it's a testament yeah. that he actually has good taste, <laughs> <laughs> and and no doubt uh, in my mind, and I think this was commented on in your retirement, which we'll talk about at the end, but th that uh, I think all of your homes will have that lasting quality of uh, of of value, artistic uh, expression, and um, historical preservation. I think that. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show was to illustrate really your great contribution in artistry, uh, much like, you know, if you don't mind my saying, a Julia Morgan or, you know, a, a Frank Lloyd Wright. I know I'm raising the bar a lot here, but uh, your contribution, as we'll see further mm -hmm. on, is, is to me of that stature. And I, I know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but one of the things I wanted to comment on is that your movement back and forth is not typical of, uh, of what I would think of as a college experience or an education, typical education. I mean, you went from um, uh, college to internships to building, back to college, back to hands-on design and building, back to college. So you really were able to incorporate the real world in your studies, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of lacking in a lot of educational enterprises that you were able to combine design uh, and construction hands-on experience yeah it, it was it was uh, it was an adventure and it, it sort of unfolded it was a story that I was not clearly clear which what was the next chapter but as I was completing the Malibu project I got a pitch and a draw from the architects in San Francisco, Osborne and Stewart, who I had apprenticed with for several years, to come back 
and help shepherd a project back on San Juan Ridge. So I had to negotiate with Yale to get another two-year extension to say, wait, I will come back and finish my master's program in architecture, but I, I really have this project that I need to do. Mm -hmm. So I went to San Francisco, helped do the drawings, and, and then became licensed and bonded and bid on and successfully got the contract to build the San Juan Ridge Country School on Oak Tree Road in uh, near North San Juan. And this was, a again, a, a huge community effort. The school really represented the, the coming together of the whole community of San Juan Ridge in the early 70s. This, you know, everyone who worked on the, on the school lived there. We used local labor and, and, and materials throughout. We were struck by the unions from Yuba City and we had to pour all the concrete for it on site using many wheelbarrows and, and mixers out of uh, the mining days. And so the, the, the building is built in the style and in the vernacular of the, of the community and the heritage of, um, of the foothills. These are log cabin buildings, uh, probably the first log cabin buildings designed to comply with the Earthquake Field Act and required special pinning uh, between the logs, uh, board and batten siding. These were all classrooms. The log cabins were the arts and crafts. These were two classrooms out on the east wing. Um, stained glass and uh, porcelain tile and special fixtures like this hanging wheel were, were really donations and design elements that came about during the construction process. So it was the whole building was sort of infused by co contributions from the community stone that was gathered. There was a, a high level of volunteerism in building this project. So, um, you know, that, that really set my seeds deeply on San Juan Ridge and in Nevada County as a place where I wanted to come back to. After completing the school, um, I returned to Yale in 76 to, to I really wanted to finish my my studies there, and there was a professor there, uh, Bruce Goff, that I was particularly uh, attracted to. Bruce happened to be a close friend of Frank Lloyd Wright, was some people consider him um, like a son to, to him, even though he never worked with Wright. Uh, they had a very close relationship, and, and Bruce Goff was actually commuting between Norman Oklahoma and New Haven, Connecticut to be able to keep his architectural practice going as he taught uh, this design studio. That was a picture of a very grandfatherly figure who really encouraged the creative process and, and really taught me how to hold a design in, in my head and not commit it to paper until I saw the whole building. Mm -hmm. And so this was a sort of a, a discipline and um, sort of a creative process that he helped me get in touch with that, um, that to, 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 in a sense, envision the whole before you commit to any one part. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very thoughtful process and I know that you know, as an artist, you might want to have a design uh, in mind, but I also know that projects incorporate clients and uh, the public and the community. I mean, we'll talk about that as we go through some of your community projects. But uh, you have to sit down with someone who has also has a vision and some ideas as to what they would like and the ability to incorporate that as well in your picture. How, you know, how, would, how would you manage that dialogue? Well, that's <clears throat> usually referred to as the programming portion. And there's, there are many, many conversations that take place between an architect and a client about the, re the specific requirements that are being called for and understanding the site and understanding the budget and understanding all the parameters that have an influence on the design. And it's holding all of that information. It's one, it's gathering it, and then it's holding it and allowing it to percolate inside and before committing yourself to a design process and, and allowing that percolation to go on internally so that you can see the whole building uh, before 
starting to draw. Mm -hmm. and, and that was what Bruce Goff really recommended, is to really to, to treat the process organically and treat it holistically. <laughs> So um, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the things that I would look forward to in working with you is you know, sharing my ideas. If I were a client, sharing my ideas and have them percolate. And then you present uh, a design. And I would imagine that most of your clients would be sort of, um, well, what, what would be the reaction? Uh, my reaction would be, wow, you know, this is incredible. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't seen it. Um, what, what um, reactions were you receiving from the clients you know, of over 250 homes and design projects mm -hmm. you've gotten, if you could summarize? <clears throat> I think, generally speaking, the, the process is, is one of dialogue between mm -hmm. the architect and the client, or in many cases, the client group. I'm oftentimes working with a committee. So it's, it's, it's a process of presenting an idea, a design idea, a picture of what does this building look like, how does it unfold, how, does it, how is it experienced, how does it address the program of, of, of function, mm -hmm. and, um, and then soliciting you know, the client's reaction, understanding of it. Sometimes clients don't read drawings, sometimes mm -hmm. they need models, sometimes they need three-dimensional uh, rendering. So it really behooves, uh, it, it required me to, to understand what each client needed to fully understand the design. Right. And sometimes I would present more than one design. I mean sometimes in this percolation process there's, there, there are multiple images that come up that, that I want to explore with the client. So it's not a fait accompli, this is your mm -hmm. design, this is your your building. Nice. You know, nice. it's it. So, um, so, yeah, I was wondering that uh, as you refer to your concepts and designs uh, and your experience at the UC Berkeley in the environmental program there, uh, are there some guiding values or um, uh, guideposts that you use in your work that you refer to, you know, that you kind of uh, see as your guides? Well, I think the, 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 the main, the, 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 the fundamental backbone of architecture is, for me, the obligation to fulfill certain functional requirements of the program. <clears throat> but I, I have been, um, in, in my work, feeling that, that each building is, we are birthing a being with a building. That the building has a life of its own and it has a spirit of its own. And drawing out and being able to infuse a building with its spirit and its being is really the, 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 the conveyance of sense of durability and sustainability and how a building actually has a conversation with its occupants and its users. And it's, and it's that spirit, that sense of being is, is really the, you might say, the, the, spir the spiritual aspect or the artful aspect of architecture. And, you know, that, that's really mm -hmm. been my quest in my work as a, as a larger value. Well, we should really <clears throat> take a look at some of the project images uh, because they really illustrate exactly yep. what you're saying. Uh, so we can maybe move on to this well, first I'll just, one. I'll just speak to when I set up my, my architectural practice, this was uh, the chicken coop for the Coughlin family in 1977. This was my first <laughs> architectural commission on San Juan Ridge. Um, set, setting, uh, settling in a rural community of less than a thousand people over a hundred square miles, we really um, had to do anything that anyone asked us to do. And, and some of our projects were actually self-initiated with um, applying for a grant from the state housing and community development to, to be able to provide assistance to owner builders. And um, we received a grant from the Department of um, of 
energy to build a solar kiln. This is a, a little drawing, uh, a little writing studio built on a trail where all the materials were hauled in uh, with a 15 minute walk. This was, um, so this was Gary Snyder's Gary, originally. Gary Snyder's uh, writing studio. Yeah. This is the solar wood drying kiln for, that was an experimental project um, by the Department of Energy and to, to provide wood drying capabilities in rural areas where there's no electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the opportunity to move our architectural office to North Columbia in the old one-room schoolhouse. This is a building built in 1870, and the school, the public school, had to vacate this building because of the earthquake um, requirements for public schools. So it lay fallow for a few years, and because of my relationship with the Coughlins, they, who owned this school, and actually their families built this school in 1870 when they first settled in North Columbia uh, during the mining period. Um, they in, allowed my partner at the time, Bruce Boyd, and I to set up our architectural office inside this schoolhouse and to renovate it also as the community center, which began, the be this was the beginning of the North Columbia Schoolhouse Cultural Center, which is still, which is now a, a real thriving uh, center on San Juan Ridge. Storytelling festival each summer, yes. lots of activities um, happening there. Um, is, it, is it, they have a, a Woodstock-like uh, festival, mm -hmm. they're always, um, you know, music, poetry, it is a community center for sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, but, but the, what I was really moving on to were the, uh, the projects like Bluestone and River, uh, Yuba River House, the following uh, illustrations, which really began to expand your horizon from working on the ridge to working more in town and out of town and doing commission, uh, commissions, uh, which really began to challenge you uh, on a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the next set of pictures really take us through a period in the 80s. I moved my office into Nevada City and set up a sole practice, um, first in the New York Hotel and then later in the studio that I built. Uh, this was a bridge, the bridge building at the corner of Spring and, and Bridge Street. That's the home right now of KVMR, and it was built as a as an office building, um, which uh, and I designed and constructed this this building um, to be in tune with the the colors and forms of the mining town, but at the same time um, doing something that was uh, contemporary and, and suited uh, current office needs. Um, this is a project back on the ridge, the Ring of Bone Zendo, that was a community project. Uh, much like Gary and Moss's house, it was timber framed with poles and using local incense cedar board and batten. Very simple structure for uh, meditation groups and it's, um, an active uh, uh, retreat center. Mm -hmm. From my experience building the San Juan Ridge Country School, we had an ongoing relationship with the school district there and they got some state funds to build an even more remote school in the town of, uh, town of North Bloomfield near the state park. This is the Malakoff School, a three-roomed classroom uh, completely off-grid, and um, it's now being used uh, as a community center for that uh, more rural area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so uh, as you began to, um, you know, work on the ridge, how did you uh, begin to interface with the community? At what point did you decide to leave the Ridge moved to town and develop a practice that was more town-centered here. The the impetus to move to town really was driven by um, our children starting 
high school and not wanting to subject them to a school for an hour long school bus ride mm -hmm. there and back. And mm -hmm. so um, my wife and I um, moved into town and looked for a piece of property. And in a sense, um, I started another phase of my career of a, of a sole practice and uh, living on um, outside of town a few miles and having my office as in a studio as part of my home mm -hmm. environment. So um, some of the early experiences that were especially important was one was um, designing um, a home for Helen Parnell uh, called Bluestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was um, a few miles out of town on a, um, we can take some picture, uh, some look at some of the pictures of this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it was on a um, old mining reclamation site in a wooded setting and had um, water uh, seeping out of the ground. And this is a, a picture of the, the site plan. Um, and integral with the house design was a water garden where we uh, gathered the springs coming onto the site and uh, directed them in a water garden that surrounded the house. Just to look at the design concept, you can see how uh, holistic, you know, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece just to look at, let alone um, uh, see it come to fruition as a structure that, that people live in and enjoy the surroundings. I mean, mm -hmm. you can begin to see it already. Uh, uh, it's lovely. It's a, it's a small home. Um, this is a picture of this, this site um, that literally had been somewhat desecrated from the mining days and, and there was water seeping everywhere. So we had to develop a drainage system to gather that water. And um, the house is a small home, about 2,200 square feet for, um, Helen was a single woman and um, uh, Part of the concept of the house was to have it a, a simple home that was durable, low maintenance. It's all stucco on the exterior with a slate uh, roof. And um, really the emphasis is the connection of the house to the garden. Uh, there are two wings, a private realm and a public realm so that she could open it up for, for groups to, to meet. And uh, her home has been, you know, quite uh, a community place where uh, people have, have meditated here for the last 20 years on a weekly basis. So there's some entry doors, um, a view of the, the main living room, um, and um, the kitchen and dining room, all of which are open to each other. And, it, and what I see already beginning to emerge in your design work is a sense of um, wood, you know, the use of wood, uh, light, water, rock. It seems like you're quite um, um, in tune with, uh, you know, elements of the environment and incorporate that as, as, as distinctive sort of qualities. You know, I, I have always been drawn to natural materials and allowing them to speak, allowing the simple lines and the composition of the home to, to in a sense, quietly unfold itself and to give it a, a sense of, of peacefulness and human scale and a sense of transparency and allowing light and air to move through it easily. Right. So there are... <laughs> are um, you know, there are comments that are made, and we'll, we'll see further, that um, as you mature as an architect and really are building, um, you know, have, have acquired a body of work, more and more as people experience your homes, and they would make the comment walking in, oh, this is, this is a Jeff Gold home, isn't it? And so what would, how would you describe those qualities that have, that have evolved over time that define your work? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's hard to, it's hard right. to put, um, you know, my finger on it. I, I appreciate that mm -hmm. sense of recognition that I have a signature. I don't feel that I'm not trying to um, 
overlay, in a sense, um, a, a preconceived notion around any project. I really, um, each project I try to speak to me as a, as a unique point of beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, I think some of the common characteristics that, that in, in someone making a, a statement like that might be connecting to is that, um, is that sense of, of, of scale and interconnectedness, the sense that a building has a conversation with you and that there are you know, long, meridian lines that allow the energy to flow through it. And those, I think that, you know, we've all had the experience of buildings speaking to us mm. or us having an emotional response when we are moving through or entering into a space. And, th and that, that emotive kind of connection between a person and a space is really what I have been working at in my projects. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of the interiors that you've created which um, illustrate the interplay between uh, light exterior and interior mm -hmm. use of wood. Well, this uh, first image is a, a house that I call the Ark House because it, it, it's a simple shed roof that um, literally encompasses the whole home. What we're looking at is the living, dining, kitchen area with the entry and a clear story lighting uh, allows the eastern morning light to come into the space and on the western opposing side is the full view to the to the oaks and the overall site setting so this is a really a home that's really trying to uh, open up and create a, a very transparent uh, movement of all the spaces under one simple form this home in Nevada City um, is literally glass on one side looking into the, the pines and the oaks and um, a series of floating uh, planes of pine ceiling and walls. And so this is, uh, it's a very small intimate space, but again, it's combining living, dining, and kitchen area in one f flowing uh, simple space. This space, uh, this home was, uh, is actually my own residence that was designed 20 years ago for my wife to teach music in our home uh, to small children. So the living room actually uh, that we're looking at here encompasses a sitting area and then be behind the couch, between the couch and the cabinetry is a, uh, a music instructional area with piano and uh, an area for small children to group uh, for singing and record, recorder lessons. This home um, was designed to incorporate a art collection. So there is an interplay of wall panels to display um, artwork and um, also antique furniture as part of the overall setting. This home is um, at the edge of Bodie Ridge that has views to the, um, to the coastal range and up to the Sierra Buttes. And it's, it's, um, it's again, it's a, a space that is uh, embracing the living, dining, and kitchen area with a family room beyond that's also uh, open and the ceiling is a unifying uh, uh, wood paneled area with soffits on either side with built-in lighting. This is a uh, dining space that is open to the entryway and there's a sandblasted etched panel that I designed to separate this round dining room from a passageway that links the living room and the kitchen behind us. This home was for someone who had an extensive library, so um, all of the walls that were not windows and doors to the outside um, are literally floor-to-ceiling bookcases. And uh, what we're looking at is the, 
the fireplace, which is a focal point for the living room, and uh, the photograph is taken from the study, which overlooks the living room. This home creates some separation with a cabinet, cabin, cabinetry for display. Um, the cabinet separates the kitchen from the dining area, but the overall form of the, of the ceiling and the flow of the details allows there to be a, a conversation between the kitchen and the dining room. So it's, it has that balance of formal and informal quality. This is a, uh, a studio for a poet writer, and uh, he was looking for a space to do his writing and to have a sense of meditation and inward view. So here we created a literally a large uh, arced half circle window that looked down into a um, almost like a secret meditative garden. So there was not, it wasn't a view to the distant, but it was more of an intimate uh, inward view. This is a, a very extensive kitchen for a, a home that's used as for camps and retreats. So the focal point of this kitchen was an island uh, five feet by ten feet that uh, literally a dozen people could work around and, and cook together. This is a, a home, uh, we're looking at the interior, so as you come in, your, immediate, your eye is immediately allowed to go back out to the outside and to a water, a water garden, and there's this sense of transparency of the interior space and an immediate connection between the interior and exterior. Well, it's really apparent <laughs> that you relate intimately with your clients and incorporate their needs, desires with your own sense of design. I know one of the most significant uh, homesteads that you have worked on is one that overlooks the South Yuba Canyon. So let's take a look at that and really enjoy the magnificence of both the view and the design. Well, this, this particular home had a a very challenging program. The client came to me and um, really said that I wanted a home on a, in a very steep canyon area. I wanted it to be self-sufficient. Uh, I wanted it to be built with natural materials. I wanted you to. I want you to think outside the box. So the challenge here was to create a home that um, really stretched the conventional. Uh, forms and norms of what we think about as home. Um, this is a picture of the home in, in construction. As you can see, there's uh, ridge beams and uh, circular forms. The, the, the center of the home is a living room, kiva-like, with all the beams that radiate off that steel ring. And out from that steel ring are radial uh, ridge beams to express two forms. Um, two wings of the house. I, I imagine this home as a, uh, as a faceted gem in the landscape so that in a sense it, the, the larger form could be uh, to dematerialize and more fuse with the landscape and um, by giving it a more faceted uh, scale to the individual parts it be, takes on a more um, human quality and a more receptive nature and its connection to the landscape. The client wanted to minimize the intrusion of vehicles, so we have very little driveway on this very steep site. And um, the home was to be fire resistant, so all the exterior walls are stone and the roof is slate tile. Um, and there's a very small courtyard as a point of entry. We're looking from the covered walkway into this courtyard space that is the one deer-proof area for a small or ornamental and herb garden. And this is another view of the upper section of the courtyard, and it's deer-proof by the nature of the stone walls and the trellis on top. 
It was a it was a challenge to encourage the stonemasons to deviate from their sense of of straight lines and plumb walls and trying to uh, encourage them to think about the more uh, imperfect and um, the more relaxed form of the wall to allow it to, in a sense, blend with the natural rock outcrops of the site and to let it flare at the bottom to, in a sense, create a, a seamless connection between the, the site and the land and the house. Here we're looking at the home from below and there's an extensive solar array for heating the home um, through a radiant heated floor system. The house is off the grid, so all the power comes from solar panels and a photovoltaic uh, system with batteries, and then all the heating is, is solar. So this is a, um, a very self-sufficient homestead with a very small energy footprint, despite its size. This is a view from the interior. All the doors and windows were custom designed for the, for the project and were fabricated by local craftsmen. Uh, this is the, the front doors and uh, the entryway steps down into the living room. Approximately five levels to this house to reflect the, the slopes of the site. And here we're looking at the kitchen, looking beyond into the dining room. So there's again the sense of connectedness of spaces, um, no hallways, no walls, but a sense of transparency and looking through the home in all directions. This is um, the home office um, and looking out towards Rock Creek. This home, uh, one wing goes out towards Rock Creek, which is a tributary of the Yuba River and um, many of the pieces of furniture for the home were fabricated from the black oak that was harvested from the land and crafted by local furniture makers. Look, stepping out from the dining room and the central living room is a terrace that overlooks the river and the creek and we're looking at um, uh, that terrace from below uh, so that terrace is actually up uh, one floor from the ground and there's a lower terrace underneath it which is shaded. That's a pretty uh, fantastic structure and I'm sure one that will last many years be beyond us. It was, it was a pleasure to do this home mm -hmm. because the client really wanted uh, something that was sustainable and durable and really pushed me to think about the 100 year or 200 year longevity of a, a homestead. This is a great lead into the sense of community that has drawn many, as, many of us here because uh, one of those buildings that speaks to us is the Briar Patch Co-op. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure if, if that's what is next, but we should see um, we can take a look at the co-op design and um, yeah, here it is uh, because this was, uh, uh, you know, the co-op 30 plus years has been in its growth and the store has really been the culmination and you designed the store uh, with, and so, so take it from here. Well, this was a wonderful experience to be able to design not just a food market but but a community center of sorts a, a real hub and you know how do you make a market a place that people feel enlivened by and a place where they can have conversation with their friends and people that they come up um, to meet there as part of the going to market experience and and that sense of connection and conversation really was uh, a central theme of the design of this building and it's it's in the small details it's in the in the space and it's the proportion it's the relationship it's the light it's it's how how you allow that conversation to take place in as many ways as possible on a 
almost, you know, because you cannot dictate where those conversations take place. They sometimes in the aisles, sometimes, you know, in, in the interstices of, of a meeting through the door. You can't just walk in and walk out of the Briar Patch <laughs> without bumping into someone and having a conversation. That's certainly been my experience. And, yeah. and um, uh, it's uh, something that uh, Jeff and I have enjoyed uh, over the years now, actually, uh, both being on the Briar Patch Board. Uh, the, the, the dialogue continues because, uh, you know, we're celebrating uh, another year, another successful year. The market's thriving, you know, it's packed, uh, people enjoy it. The whole conversation about healthfulness and environment, I mean, it's incorporated in the building in the quality of the food, um, in in the uh, outreach to community, it's it's a living project, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's continuing to grow. Yeah, the co-op has been a model project. It was the first LEED certified building in Nevada County, and there was a lot of intention around the sustainability, the choice of materials, the the use of recycled products, and um, you know how finishes were going to affect the, the, the people that came into the building. So. Yeah. So um, now, you know, we're, uh, I'm sort of moving from the personal to the community in the sense that you've done a variety of, uh, of um, homes and, and building can designs. And I look at it over 250 projects in 45 years, that's, um, you know, five, uh, five projects a year, you know, on the average. And when you think about completing five projects a year when you're only having a certain building period of time, that's ambitious. That's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a lot of work. Uh, but your movement has, you continue to do homes, but your movement has been more and more towards community. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the, la the last <clears throat> 10 or 15 years I've been doing more public buildings. Um, and I'm not sure whether we can pull these slides up, but um, the, <clears throat> the, the projects that were really uh, benchmarked for this phase of my career um, started with um, the Briar Patch mm -hmm. and has included a um, substance abuse treatment center, um, cold well, core. Let me, and let, let me interrupt because I don't want to pass over some of the major projects that we have planned. So let's mm -hmm. go into, um, you know, the Uber River House and others, oh, okay. and then come back because all these homes have a public function as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if we could continue with the next batch of slides, that would be great. Yeah. And this would be. Uh, so this is um, these series of slides sort of give you uh, an overview of, of a, a, d a dozen projects done over the last 15 years. Uh, this house is called the Arc House. Um, it's actually a, a, a large curve to be able to embrace a grove of oak trees on the downhill side. We're looking at the entrance here. <clears throat> This is a, a restoration project uh, in Nevada City, uh, 1874 house that was completely lifted off the ground and completely re renovated from a foundation up to the roof. Um, this home is in Lake Wildwood on the lake and um, because of the steep hillside, it consists of um, a series of forms and floor levels. Uh, there are a total of eight floor levels within this home. So it's all about the interconnection of these spaces as it flows down the hillside and looks over. Um, this is a home um, overlooking lower Scotts Flat Lake and um, uh, very much an indoor, outdoor uh, with, uh, experience with a courtyard on the, on the uphill side. Um, Again, a, a 19th century, this home's about 130 years old that was completely renovated um, in Nevada City. This I, I call the, 
mission modern home. Uh, the homes, the, the walls are 12 inches thick, made of, of recycled concrete block, with a very high, very insulated uh, quality. Um, this is a, a very hot site, lower foothills, but no air conditioning because of the thermal mass of the building. So this is a very, very um, uh, this is a home in Cedar Ridge, and uh, the owners of this home have opened it up, and it was partly designed as a chamber music um, venue, so they um, hold concerts in their home periodically. This is a, um, started as a, a renovation uh, remodel of a log cabin and grew into actually a whole new home. Um, a ranch style home. This is um, a home again uh, on the grid but zero net electrical energy due to the electrical photovoltaic panels and solar heating for the um, that comes through the floor heating system. This is a uh, home overlooking the Yuba River, uh, tile roofs, stucco walls that are very uh, good materials for this climate. This is the Celio house on, on just Gethsemane, and uh, it's one of the oldest homes in town, an Italianate Victorian that was lifted off the ground, uh, a full basement built underneath it and set back down. In the, Every stitch of this building was, was reconstructed based upon its original um, uh, form and detail. This home um, has an expansive view on the downhill side and this uh, pond on the uphill side uh, used as a, a major feature of the home. And this um, is the uh, uh, extensive remodel of a 1920s bungalow. And um, uh, this is a retreat center uh, used by, opened up by the owners. People come from all over the world to study with the owners about flower essences, which they grow on site. This was a 1950s um, ranch home completely rebuilt and, and refashioned in a, a bungalow style um, as the owner had desired with terraced gardens around. This is a, uh, the original Baptist church in Nevada City built in 1880 um, and then it was transformed from a church into the Powell House. The Powell family made some of the early soda um, soda drinks in town and so there was a bottling uh, factory inside this building and now you know, it's, it's been reborn as a, uh, a mixed use uh, apartments and commercial and um, yeah, this building has been completely rebuilt from the foundation all the way up but respecting all the details. Um, this is a home on Deer Creek um, very, very simple home, um, monochromatic in its finishes, and it's basically one, a one-room house uh, with expansive views looking out down towards the creek. This is a, actually a picture going back to the early 90s of the Sierra Presbyterian Church. That was uh, very much a, a, pub it's a public building. Um, a lot of concerts were given, and it's... Um, it's right in town. Right in town. Yeah. This is a recent project in Davis, uh, the Unitarian Church. Uh, built, we built uh, a new social hall and completely renovated the sanctuary um, and completed a master plan looking ahead for the 50 years of, of build out on the campus. Uh, with RE classrooms and um, a larger sanctuary. This is their existing sanctuary, which was completely re renovated as part of the project. Um, <clears throat> this building was um, retrofitted with fire sprinklers and theatrical lighting and 
tuned acoustically with uh, new lighting system and, and finishes throughout. This is the AJA uh, video company in Grass Valley and um, over a five year span designed and oversaw the construction of, of their campus um, which consists of two buildings, manufacturing. This building is the engineering building for 100 engineers um, to develop their products. And this is a, a rendering of the core um, drug treatment center in, um, on Sierra College Drive in Grass Valley. This is outpatient and, and uh, residential treatment for substance abuse and it's a really a model, model project that was funded by the United States um, Department of Agriculture that has a program to um, assist health facilities in rural communities. So we really see your project, and maybe we can just take a break here from the, uh, from the images of the community and come back to this one. But we can really see that your projects have, uh, have developed in a scale and um, outreach that uh, you're doing more and more commercial. Uh, although I don't, I don't know if you would say that, but um, that you have commercial uh, work uh, your present one is uh, the KVMR uh, project, which we'll return to in a moment. But uh, the idea that um, uh, what, what has brought you to more and more community-based commercial projects? Well, I, I think in, to some extent those projects have come to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've welcomed the opportunity to to do more public buildings, to be working with nonprofit and community-based groups. Um, while I continue to enjoy doing um, the architecture of, of private homes, um, in the last 10 years, my work has been gravitating more towards um, larger public buildings. And I've really appreciated that opportunity to be able to have a larger impact and to be able to participate in organizations and to have client groups where there's a committee, not just a single private individual. Mm -hmm. So in that process, I feel that I've been able to express um, more my, my sense of commitment to community values and, and the, the, the experience of collectively accomplishing mm -hmm. the construction of a building that fulfills a a, a deep need um, in a group, amongst a group of people. So let's go back to the KVMR <laughs> slide because that's the current project going on mm. and that's the one that's going to take you into retirement, right? Yeah. This is one of my last projects mm. and it really is, it's, it's quite fitting because it's right in downtown Nevada City. It's with a community organization. I've been working with them for over three years and we've just broken ground on a a new building that's fashioned as uh, in the spirit of the old warehouse buildings that were on the site, which we tanned and disassembled and have saved all the timbers and the metal which we're going to repurpose in the new building. And this old style building downtown will actually house a state of the art series of studios, a community meeting room, a little performance space and offices for the staff. So we have an opportunity to do, um, to, 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 for me, it's, it's um, a lifetime, op you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to do a building that contributes to the fabric downtown in our arts and uh, in our voice of the community. This is really providing a, a, you know, what I look at as an essential service of where people can come together mm -hmm. and share a sense of information, education, and culture together. It's already being considered a centerpiece as we hear of the Bridge Street Project and the Miners Foundry being pulled in and mm -hmm. the idea of Nevada City more and more as a cultural mecca. It really helps to create that um, um, sort of statement. <clears throat> now you're 64 years old. You're, some people think of you at the, as the peak, at the peak of your experience, and yet you're retiring. 
So can you talk a little bit as we go into, you know, you, you recently had a retirement party, a wonderful retrospective on your work, uh, uh, testimonies by many of your friends and clients as to your contributions. So um, can you tell us about um, why you're deciding at this point in time mm -hmm. to, um, to <clears throat> sort of uh, put it down and move on? It's been a difficult decision, um, you know, because I've, I, love my work and um, I still feel very much involved in the community and enlivened by opportunities to dialogue and work with people. I have decided to transition into the unknown and to create a new chapter for myself and I'm not sure where that's going to go. It may be that I provide ongoing consultation and I'm still involved with community projects. I just don't know, but I'm taking a pause. It's like taking a sabbatical after working very hard for, you know, 45 years. Um, and doing the show, the exhibit, um, a few weeks ago was an opportunity for me to, to reflect on my work, to revisit buildings that I had done 30 or 40 years ago, to talk with former clients and, and just to sort of take stock of, of where I've been um, as I'm pausing right now to see what this next chapter might unfold. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to do, uh, continue to do artwork and I would like to do community work and I'm not sure exactly what form that will take but I'm really excited by that and I'm excited with the idea of creating that open space and allowing a, a new birthing process to, to occur. <clears throat> well, I think that, that um, you know, you have continued to uh, make contributions uh, both on a personal, public, community level throughout your life. Uh, and it's going to be a very interesting process, uh, you know, having been friends, uh, we're actually sharing some of the same um, um, uh, phasing uh, out of one part of uh, our lives and moving into another, and so I share with you the um, the uh, you know the both the curiosity and the uh, the interest of of what this new uh, period will bring. I think that as a society, we all need to pause and think about what's going on and have a greater respect for uh, you know. Uh, one another, uh, the planet, uh, our community, uh, our loved ones, all of these are very integral parts of, um, particularly at this point in our lives, to, uh, to pause and reflect. You know, I really, you know, I think we share those feelings and I think that the, the slowing down for me, I feel, is, is, is part of trying to have a deeper conversation with myself and, and the sense of what do I want to do with the rest of, of, of my life and, um, and you know, have, be, be making sure that I make connection with my family and my friends and my community in a, in a, in a meaningful way. And um, I, I feel very fortunate to have had the career and the opportunities that I have had. And, you know, I'm deeply appreciative of um, just everything that has given, been given to me that in turn I I'll have, a, that has allowed me to, to give back. And I really appreciate being able to have this conversation mm -hmm. with you, Lou. This is extremely special and um, not only because of our friendship, but, you know, my appreciation for what you've given to this community mm -hmm. and your work, you know, over many, many years with the with the TV station and with the co-op and with you know with the schools and your your commitment to to an enlivened and participatory sense of of being together in a small rural community has been just a wonderful experience. Well, thank you, Jeff. And in, in that same sense, I want to thank our crew. Uh, Jay Kuska, our director, uh, Steve Baker on audio, uh, Catherine Bush on camera, and Ivy Cohn on uh, floor direction and camera, all volunteering, 
all part of a community effort to, uh, to bring really important issues, events, people, contributions here to, uh, to uh, make our public more aware of what, um, of what local TV can do for our community. And I hope that in the future we'll be able to continue with public support uh, one way or another, our community will continue to grow and thrive. We have so much creativity here uh, and so much uh, dedication and awareness of what's important in life that um, I continue to derive a lot of uh, happiness and satisfaction from being here. So thank you as well. Thanks.